My name is Bruce McDonald. I was born in Vancouver and have lived in Grandview since 1988. I'm a historian and most of my work has involved studying the history of Vancouver as well as the history of Grandview itself. Grandview is an interesting place today in part because many people love to come to Grandview to go shopping or to go out at night to go to a restaurant, to go to a bar or to stroll up and down its main street, Commercial Drive. It's an interesting question to ask, why is Grandview this way, that it's a popular destination and also popular as a place to live? It wasn't necessarily planned this way by the city, but it is the way it is right now. How did it get to be this way? Before we talk about the way Grandview is, perhaps we should define exactly what it is and what I mean by that is, what is unique about Grandview? What is it that is special about Grandview? What is it that people seem to like and enjoy about Grandview? So let's just take a moment to look at a few of the, the major factors that make up the community of Grandview in the present day. One important uniqueness of Grandview, you can see in this map, this land use map, um, most of the yellow areas of Vancouver are houses, single-family dwellings, at least they have been until recently. But Grandview in, in the east there, the area close to Commercial Drive has been zoned duplex for a long time. The houses look like single-family dwellings, but almost all of them have two suites and perhaps an illegal suite, three suites, and some of them have four suites and even five suites because they've been converted uh, in the 1950s into more units. Uh, this makes for a variety of housing, even though it doesn't look like it. And it also, um, that variety with small suites and medium-sized suites and, suites and large suites, of course, it creates a diversity of rental accommodation. And uh, for this reason, I suppose, um, Grandview has more than its fair share of young people. The, the number in their, I think, mid-20s is about double the average uh, in the lower mainland. Um, young single people and a lot of them involved in the arts field in one way or another about five times as many as is the average in the lower mainland. So again this is an important part of what makes commercial drive special. It can accommodate these people that are perhaps working in a coffee shop on commercial drive but they're pursuing their artistic dream. Now the other thing, if you see when you look at this map, is is west of Commercial Drive and north of Hastings, of course, it's apartment. And again, that's a different type of person that settles there. Uh, then we have the industrial areas. Those are purple, all the way down to the waterfront. And those areas supply jobs, um, as well as uh, mixing things up a bit. The blue areas are the public areas, places such as schools, uh, community centers, such as the very large blue area there is Britannia, and uh, elementary schools, high schools, that type of hospitals, that type of thing. One last note, as you look at the map on the right there, you might notice the word Grandview out in the green wilderness. Um, that's because uh, the streetcar line was built down Commercial Drive in 1891, but the area was pretty far out and pretty remote and wasn't really settled until 1905. Uh, it was named in 1891 when somebody stepped off the streetcar at the top of the hill at Grant Street on Commercial Drive and noted the fantastic view and therefore named the area Grandview. Um, it's interesting, a few people tried to develop subdivisions back in this time. Uh, for example, Captain Cop bought 18 acres uh, east of Commercial Drive, actually east of Victoria Drive, and he tried to develop it as a, as a subdivision in 1894. And of course, he wasn't able to sell virtually a single lot. Um, they did sell, however, around 1909, 1910, and that little anomaly, that subdivision that was designed in 1894 with 25 foot lots and no back lanes. That is now our beloved Rose Street and Lily Street neighborhood. 
um, again, a uniqueness to commercial drive at Grandview uh, that most neighborhoods don't have. The, the other neighbor, or parts of the neighborhood that don't have back lanes, such as around McSpadden Street and East 3rd, um, East 4th, and 5th, again, that was another 1890 subdivision that has created a special area to this day. If we look at what's left of those Edwardian Victorian buildings, you can see on this map the original Victorian buildings, that is the buildings built up to 1901, are shown as orange. The gray areas, the dark gray and the light gray, are newer construction that replaced the original 1901 buildings. Also on this map, it quite nicely shows the Edwardian parts of the city, the parts built between 1901 and 1913, how much of them remain today? Now, what makes Grandview particularly appealing is that a number of the commercial buildings, which is that dark gray strip down the middle of Grandview, a number of those buildings, quite a number, are retained, as well as the Edwardian residential areas. This is unlike the other Edwardian parts of the city. Now, just on this topic of communities that have older buildings, in Jane Jacobs' book here, and notice the quote at the bottom from the New York Times book review, perhaps the most influential single work in the history of town planning. Jane Jacobs says that when you have an old community with old buildings, you tend to have uh, landlords that have got their mortgages paid off, and the buildings are older and not as nice as the shiny new buildings that so many people like. And so they rent for less. And what this means is, is that young, creative people can start new businesses and do interesting things. This is an important factor in what makes a great community. And that is a variety of opportunities for interesting things to happen. This, again, uh, reflects back on the diversity that Grandview has, a diversity of accommodation, diversity of people, diversity of all kinds. It is not a homogenic place. It is a place that's a mosaic of different things that come together to create a, a great overall effect. Now here's another thing about commercial drives at Wardian commercial buildings. Just as a lot of them are being built in 1910, just over a century ago, the city decided to make Commercial Drive a regular thoroughfare and increase it from four lanes wide to six lanes wide. In order to do this, they required all of the buildings south of First Avenue uh, on Commercial to be pulled back using winches and horses and so forth, uh, seven feet from where they were to create another lane of traffic. So this was done south of Commercial. When they started to do it north of Commercial, there are a number of rather large brick buildings that really couldn't be moved. And so these are left in place, but any new building after 1910 was required to be built seven feet back. Well, this created uh, an unexpected consequence, which now contributes to Commercial Drive's success. It contributes to the success of Commercial Drive by creating this unusual strip of land that is then available for things such as cafe seating, outdoor seating. So the best example, of course, is Havana Restaurant just opposite Grandview Park. It has the largest outdoor seating of any restaurant in East Vancouver. And this is simply because of this unintended consequence of widening uh, Commercial Drive from four lanes to six. Of course, because this part north of Commercial is four lanes wide, it's a more popular part of Commercial Drive of the better street scene and also the fact the street's only four lanes wide. It's less like a highway and it, so it has a nicer feel. The other place of course where this seven-foot setback has made a huge difference is at Norman's Market 
which is, sells very inexpensive vegetables in this very colorful and noticeable display. And clearly, a big reason they do such a big volume is it's very hard to go by this place without being drawn in uh, by this beautiful display of um, delicious looking vegetables. Same thing, of course, applies further down the block at Santa Barbara Market and, and at a few other places now on the drive where there's these tremendous displays, enticing to say the least. Another feature of Commercial Drive that contributes to its success is having a city park that's a full city block right on Commercial Drive, right at one of the main parts of the north section. The park actually has a grand view of the downtown skyline uh, and is named Grand View Park. And it is probably the only place on Commercial Drive you can actually see the Grand View as a pedestrian. Of course, the park has lots of amenities. It has a playground, it has a washroom, it has a, a kitty uh, outdoor sort of water feature, and it has one of the world's first bike polo courts for playing bike polo on bicycles. And it has a cenotaph with a large seating area where musicians can play and they can also play uh, on a stage area at the base of the grassy knolls. Another important feature of Commercial Drive um, is its easy access to what is effectively the Grandview Community Center. It's called the Britannia Center and it's a huge 18 acre site that's just a few feet off of Commercial Drive at Napier Street. This is a picture of the greenway that leads you from Commercial Drive to the Britannia Center and right there in front of you is an elementary school, a high school, an information center, four gymnasiums, an auditorium, a large swimming pool, an ice rink, a playing field, you know, a track field, tennis courts, a senior center, a youth center, all kinds of amenities. As a matter of fact when it was created uh, the Britannia Center in 1976 was perhaps unique in North America in being such a large complex on the model of the community center, but way more than that. There is other evidence of Grandview being a fairly progressive and creative neighborhood in the number of housing co-ops that reside within just a block or two of Commercial Drive. There's 19 shown here. And this is the largest concentration in British Columbia. It does say something about the people in the neighborhood and what their uh, leanings are. Um, notice that we have our own credit union, CE, CCEC, um, a tool library, a co-op bookstore, um, a, a food co-op, and so forth. Quite a remarkable number of um, cooperative enterprises in a small area. And this says a lot about the people that live here. Now, further evidence of there being many young, energetic, smart, idealistic, and artistic type people in the neighborhood. We have the Vancouver East Cultural Center shown here. And it's actually three buildings. The green building on the left was the home of Vancouver Little Theater, and then Vancouver East Cultural Center in the middle, and the old church, and then more recently, tens of millions of dollars were spent to build uh, the building on the right to further expand the capabilities of the Vancouver East Cultural Center. And by the way, this building in the center in the 70s was the home of the Vancouver Free University. And it was after that uh, closed down that the Cultural Center moved in. Uh, the arts and culture of the neighborhood has recently been expanded again with more than $10 million put into the restoration of the York Theatre and uh, now home to our annual pantomime and, uh, and an amazing variety of arts events uh, during the year. This again is another great amenity, cultural amenity for the entire neighborhood and once more um, a great example of the artistic nature of our community. Uh, we seem to have more bookstores, more Many more interesting things going on than most other neighborhoods in Vancouver. And we hope to keep it this way um, by keeping the residences that these performers and um, 
live in when they're young, starving artists. These single room uh, accommodation, not just good for young uh, people aspiring to be great artists who are working in coffee shops, but older people when they retire and they're single and on their own, on their own they also have need of inex relatively inexpensive uh, affordable accommodation. Doesn't have to be big, but people do like to live by themselves even if they are in contact with uh, other people in the old rental building that they might live in. Let's keep what we have. Now a lot of people do like Grandview the way it is and when we went through the planning process in 2012 and 13 certainly a lot of people said that and this part of Commercial Drive shown here which is just slightly east of Commercial Drive on Napier Street, this new duplex here. Um, this is an example of how the neighborhood is changing even though most people want it to you know, remain relatively the same because they like it the way it is. And um, this was reflected in the outcome last summer in the planning process where the zoning in this area was left the same. That's an interesting point about the zoning being the same. The interesting thing is, by being left the same, what is happening is this little greenhouse on the right was at the same location as the previous photograph. And this was a house that was a rooming house with nine units that roughly rented for $500 a month each. And as a, a current uh, local person noted on Facebook recently, he said that Miss Anderson's house here on Napier, when he lived there, had a folk singer in one room, a playwright in another, and a Vancouver Sun editor in another, and me there, a so-so poet. The editor was a Brit with Coke bottle bottom glasses and a hilarious wit. The playwright wrote plays and musicals about Jack Minor and other BC subjects for the Horse Drawn Caravan Theater. And he rehearsed his, rehearsed his fiddle work. Now just think about these um, artistic types that used to live in the house. When they moved in, they would have had to put down roughly $250 as a security deposit. The new people moving in within the next year will probably be putting down $250,000 as a down payment on what is approaching a million dollars for a half duplex in this neighborhood. This is clearly a radical change and I think we have to worry a little bit about losing the people that give this neighborhood a lot of character and make it what it is. Of course it's not just the artistic types, the young single artistic types, it's also older people that want to stay in the neighborhood when they retired and perhaps they're single and they're looking for a small place that's relatively affordable. We have places like that now because we have a few rooming houses. We also have houses with three, four, and five suites. Um, if we allowed a small expansion to some of these houses, bring in more bachelor suites and small suites and lock-off suites. I think this is a way to provide affordable housing for this neighborhood in a manner that's already been done in the past. It's not a radical idea in that in Kitsilano right now with the RT7 and RT8 zoning there's a similar type of thing being allowed there. Uh, clearly in Grandview we would want our own version of that type of zoning but the current RT5 and RT4 the duplex zoning, the thing that only allows for duplexes, two expensive duplexes, half duplexes, uh, is just sending our neighborhood in the wrong direction. It's, it's homogenizing the neighborhood. For a neighborhood that's known for its diversity and proud of its diversity, this is something that needs to be examined and a solution determined.